and I'm very glad to see uh, uh, some of my old friends, even in, in this virtual form, alas, not uh, in person. And I do hope that one of these meetings and gatherings will be able to be done sometime in the future in person. Uh, thanks for the, for the opportunity to share our thoughts and uh, data, so to say, about this situation, because uh, I did see from other previous uh, uh, speeches, talks, that in, may, in almost all of the Orthodox countries, the <clears throat> situation between the church and the pandemic and the state authorities and the media and so on uh, was very much similar, if not completely uh, the same. Uh, although we in Montenegro did have uh, some uh, specific uh, aspects of, uh, of the whole situation. So although I, I guess that most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the uh, religious situation in, in Montenegro, let me just give you a sort of a, a framework uh, in which in the context in which everything was was happening. So as you might know that uh, we in Montenegro have uh, as the church authority, the metropolitanate of Montenegro and Litoral. Uh, there's also another eparchy of the Orthodox Church, which operates mainly in the north of the country. And there are uh, two other eparchies uh, that are only partially uh, in Montenegro. They are all part of the Serbian Orthodox uh, Church. Uh, the situation between the state and the church has been uh, very tense in the, in the past years. Uh, especially in the past, let's say, five or six years, although the relationship between the church and the state has never been uh, very good, except during the few years of the 90s, but that ended very quickly. Uh, and what happened uh, most recently is that in 2019, the uh, government of that time uh, decided to pass a law uh, a new law on uh, religious freedom. That was, of course, in its uh, form, a much welcome uh, move because uh, the uh, law on religion that was still in use in Montenegro was dating back to 1977. So, of course, from the communist uh, era, so you can understand that basically everybody was, uh, 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 was for uh, a new law on the on the subject. Uh, however, the government decided to uh, introduce into the law uh, not only things that regulate religious freedoms and uh, position of uh, religious communities within the state, but they also decided to uh, sort of try to regulate the uh, uh, proprietary rights of religious communities. Uh, which was basically targeted, uh, not explicitly, but it was clear that it was targeted at the Serbian Orthodox Church and its eparchies. Uh, and the basic idea was that uh, since many churches and monasteries, which are in the possession of the Orthodox Church, are also part of cultural heritage of uh, Montenegro, uh, those churches and monasteries, but not only that, but also land and uh, any kind of other uh, uh, property is going to be uh, passed into the possession of the state unless the religious community, the church, can offer uh, legal evidence, legal proof that it did own the property before 1918. Uh, 1918 was introduced as the, uh, as the, as the date limit, uh, because as you probably know, 19, the 1918 was the year when uh, Montenegro, uh, previously an independent uh, state, became part of the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, which later became Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Uh, so the main ideological and historical position of the government at that time and in the past uh, 15 or 20 years 
was that uh, Montenegro did not unite itself with uh, other uh, Yugoslav territories by its own will, but that it was not a unification, but it was a sort of occupation by Serbia. Uh, they also claimed that by that time, Montenegro had its own autocephalous uh, church and the Serbia, that the Serbian Orthodox Church and uh, the, the, its main part, Metropolitanate of Montenegro and Litoral, is a sort of a occupying uh, organization on our territory. So what they did, what they tried uh, to do by, by introducing this law uh, is that they were counting on the fact that the church might not have any legal documents that prove its ownership over churches and monasteries and that they would be easily uh, able to take over all these uh, all those properties into state uh, ownership the church was of course uh, very furious about that it raised uh, its voice uh, against such uh, law However, the, despite some uh, protests at that time and some negotiations at that time, uh, the law was adopted by the then majority in the parliament in December 2019. Uh, that sparked a lot of protests and uh, unsatisfaction, not only within the church, but also of all kinds of people, not just believers, but there were also many uh, civil activists and many uh, lawyers who said that that kind of, uh, of law would be uh, unconstitutional, that it would interfere with religious freedom, uh, etc., etc. So the church uh, decided to uh, organize uh, religious processions uh, that are going to be also marked by uh, protests against such law. And they started already in late December 2019 and went on through the entire January and February of uh, 2020. Uh, those processions were actually a huge success for the church because uh, they were organized twice uh, a week on Thursdays and Sundays in basically all towns in Montenegro simultaneously. And if you put the uh, everything together it turns out that hundreds of thousands of people went onto the streets uh, to join these uh, processions which are very large numbers uh, given the fact that the whole population of Montenegro is 620,000 uh, people uh, so obviously it became also a, a political thing uh, and the uh, government in power at that time tried to do everything to uh, sort of subdue those uh, processions and to uh, try to defend its own uh, position. So in the middle of that kind of context, we got the first cases of uh, coronavirus in uh, March uh, 2020. And that's when the, all the restrictive measures and the stuff that we could see in all other countries were also in vigor in uh, Montenegro. Uh, that is also the time when these uh, large uh, processions of the church stopped. And the church at that time uh, issued a communique, a statement uh, saying that uh, due to the epidemic and due to the uh, orders of the health authorities and so on, uh, they have decided to put a halt uh, to the processions and to wait for some uh, better times when the pandemic is over. Uh, the government, on the other hand, formed a so-called national coordination body, uh, which was to uh, coordinate all the uh, health proceedings and measures and take care of the epidemic in Montenegro. Uh, it was... Uh, it consisted of a lot of uh, government officials as well as doctors, but also ministers and so on. Uh, but what is uh, important to say that essentially all of those people were of course uh, part of and in favor of the then ruling party and the government. And the interesting fact is, for, for example, that the head of the chair of this national uh, coordination body was the then deputy prime minister 
who was also Minister of Agriculture. So he was a person who had nothing to do with, uh, with health or medicine and so on. But he was there, of course, uh, due to the authority of the Deputy Prime Minister's position. But it's just an interesting fact. So in the first couple of months, let's say March and April, and perhaps part of May, this national coordination body, I believe, uh, really did gain uh, a lot of credibility among people because they were more or less uh, limited to, uh, to health procedures, to taking care of uh, the epidemic. Uh, they prescribed measures which were perhaps harsh, but were understandable, and so on and so on. However, uh, when in uh, the second part of May, and especially in June, the number of uh, infected people became to uh, decrease, started to decrease, uh, it came to a point when I think it was the beginning of June 2020, uh, when in Montenegro we had zero cases of uh, coronavirus for a couple of weeks. And then, of course, people uh, started acting more freely because they thought the pandemic is going to be over. So it didn't include just going to bars or restaurants or going out, but it also included uh, the invitation to resume the religious processions that I uh, mentioned in the uh, in the beginning that was stopped in March due to the uh, coron due to the coronavirus. What happened then was a co complete loss of credibility of this uh, national coordination body because uh, people had uh, they they felt that the measures that are uh, put in place are targeting exclusively the church and exclusively this procession for polit political reasons. A very important factor in all of that was that the parliamentary elections were scheduled for 30th of August that year. So we are talking about just a few months before the elections. And of course, it was very important politically uh, to, um, to, let's say, mitigate uh, the church's insatisfaction and all these processions that were happening at that time. Uh, I don't know if it, I didn't uh, uh, perhaps memorize well, I don't know if it happened in other uh, countries that who, whose panorama we heard today, uh, but uh, in Montenegro we had uh, three arrests uh, of priests and bishops. Uh, the archbishop uh, Amphilochia, late Archbishop Amphilochia, who was the Metropolitan of Montenegro and Litoro, one of the most influential and greatest figures in, uh, in uh, Orthodox Church of, of uh, ex-Yugoslavia and perhaps even uh, in, in some other uh, areas, was arrested right in the, at the beginning, somewhere in, at the, at, toward the end of March, uh, but he was not, uh, it, it was not an official arrest. He was, he was just, as, as they say it, uh, or as it is officially uh, called, he was invited to, the, to, to give information uh, in the police station. What was the reason? Uh, he gave funeral rites uh, to a well-known historian uh, here in Montenegro who died in, in those days, who so, and he was also his friend. So when he went there with uh, five or six members of his family uh, to the graveyard and he gave uh, the funeral rites uh, for the burial of, of this uh, historian. So he was invited to the police to give a statement uh, on that issue. Then uh, in, uh, on 12th, I think, April, <clears throat> uh, which was the Palm Sunday uh, of, of that year, uh, the Metropolitan and Philokhi and a few other priests, they uh, held a liturgy uh, in, a, um, uh, in a very old uh, ancient uh, church, which is, uh, it, it is a ruin now, but it, it is a tradition to go there every year on Palm Sunday held, called a liturgy. So he was detained again, uh, and uh, he had to go to the, uh, to the police station. Uh, and then a month later in May, uh, on the occasion of a feast of uh, Saint Basil, so not the Saint, Saint Basil the Great, but Saint Basil, uh, a 17th century 
uh, saint of, of the Serbian Orthodox Church, which, which, who is uh, respected as a great miracle worker. Uh, the Metropolitan of Filohije and Bishop Ioannikije, who is the bishop of, was the bishop of the other eparchy in Montenegro, they held a liturgy in the Cathedral Church of Nikšić, which is the second largest town in Montenegro, and it is the uh, place where the uh, relics of St. Basil are, are held. They uh, held the liturgy and there was a lot of people gathered around the church uh, because it was a decades old uh, tradition and uh, on this occasion usually there are uh, dozens of thousands of, of people uh, gathering on that day. In any case, when they finished uh, the liturgy, the people around the church, uh, they said that they want to make a procession, uh, which was also a tradition, a usual uh, thing on that day. And the Metropolitan and Philohie said that he could not say no uh, to the people, so he did lead a short uh, procession. So again, they detained him, but the, the whole blame and the whole guilt was taken over by Bishop Ioannikie, uh, who was even held overnight uh, in, in, uh, in the police station and uh, together with eight uh, other priests who were uh, assisting him. So obviously you can understand that this enraged a lot of people. A lot of people went in front of the police station to protest. Uh, the priests had to calm down the situation and tell these people uh, not to interfere and so on and so on. Uh, and the things uh, went back uh, again in uh, June and July, and uh, Metropolitan and Philokia was detained again by in the police station, and uh, he was even questioned for uh, five or six hours uh, without break, and uh, that, that was very, uh, it was negatively perceived by many people because at that time, uh, our metropolitan Philokia was an 82 year old uh, man, so uh, many people thought that uh, it was quite unfair that the state authorities are uh, prescribing masks, social distancing, prohibiting people together, and then they bring uh, an old, and, and then protecting the old people, and then they bring uh, an old person into the police station and keep him there for. Uh, five or six uh, hours. Uh, basically, what happened next is that the church realized that it cannot uh, negotiate with the actual government at that time due for the amendments of the law on religious freedom. The government was determined uh, in that way. And in one of his uh, speeches, Metropolitan of Philokia publicly uh, said, that the government that had the idea of uh, bringing, uh, of, of adopting such a law must fall. So that was basically the moment when the church decided to enter a uh, political debate and uh, to enter the, figuratively speaking, enter the race for the parliamentary elections to be held in August. Uh, that year. And actually, the, the side that was supported by the church won the elections, and the government and the ruling party that was in power in Montenegro for the 30 years before that lost the elections, and the new government was formed, and so on and so on. Uh, then uh, a, a new situation uh, came about, and uh, the government was uh, formed with many by many ministers and leading the, led by the prime minister who were actually practicing uh, uh, believers. Uh, and then of course the attacks uh, continued also against the government and against the church and so on. But <clears throat> those were the uh, events. Now the, the whole atmosphere that was uh, happening in those few months between uh, March 2020 and August 2020 and some and a few months uh, later uh, was basically that uh, the government and the pro-government actors in Montenegro and the pro-government media in Montenegro used the pandemic uh, in order to fight their war against the church, which was on the other hand trying uh, to fight for its own, uh, as, as they perceived it, for their own uh, rights. So 
there were many uh, media reporting, many political uh, statements by the then ruling parties and so on that would target uh, the church, the bishops and the priests as uh, being uh, retarded, uh, as being anachronistic, uh, as not uh, being uh, obedient to the science. Uh, and then one of the uh, most used metaphors in the public discourse was the so-called dirty spoon. Uh, the dirty spoon was mentioned every day by this kind of media and activists. And they were saying that uh, uh, people who are uh, eating or licking, that's, that those are the expressions that they used, people who lick the dirty spoon uh, are obviously uh, not uh, modern and uh, they are uh, uneducated and uh, they are made uneducated because of the church and so on and so on. So one of the, one of the statements that was, uh, uh, that, that, that was uh, published in many of this kind of media, which, which are not small media, they, they, they do have a lot of readers, uh, was during the uh, camp campaign, election campaign, with the, when the future prime minister uh, went to the church and received his communion. Uh, and so this media published this photograph of him taking the communion with the comment, uh, although he is a university professor, obviously science is his weaker side and he is not afraid of uh, infection. Obviously, he, he thinks that the dirty spoon could lead him uh, to the election victory. Uh, so this was the kind of discourse that tried to satanize, to satanize uh, the, the, the believers and the priests and all those who were against the uh, government of, the, of, of that time. Uh, however, uh, the pandemic, the epidemic did uh, provoke a lot of consequences, negative consequences. And one of the biggest consequences for the church in Montenegro was precisely the death of Metropolitan Amphilochia, who died uh, at the end of October from coronavirus. Uh, Bishop Ioannikie also contracted uh, coronavirus, but he, uh, he recovered uh, easily. Uh, and as you also know, uh, the patriarch of the Serbian Orthodox Church, Irene, he also died uh, of coronavirus, and he probably, most probably, contracted uh, the coronavirus on the funeral of the Metropolitan Amphilochia, which uh, happened in the uh, end of uh, October. So there were uh, quite a lot of losses uh, on the part of the church, but there were also losses on part of the uh, common people. And this is one uh, thing that I was uh, quite saddened uh, about. Although I must say that I never saw any kind of public statement but any, by any kind of priest or bishop who said that coronavirus does not exist or that the faith will uh, cure you from coronavirus or that if you believe you cannot uh, contract coronavirus and so on. What they kept saying is that, of course, uh, people should obey the health measures provided by the government, but they should, that should, they should also take care of their souls and uh, take care of their faith and so on and so on. But there were people who actually taught these things. Uh, and I'm not sure if, if some priest uh, in, the, in, pri in a private conversation told them that, but there was an example of a, of a person that I knew personally uh, who died of coronavirus, who, who was a practicing uh, Orthodox believer and who denied the existence of uh, coronavirus and uh, there were even some posts on social media by him uh, saying that people should not uh, take uh, medicines but they should uh, for example uh, take a grain of incense and uh, cure the coronavirus by doing that and the, the thing is that this person was not uh, an educated person he had a, he had a master's degree in electrical engineering so he was educated even in, in these hard uh, technical sciences, which you would expect that people uh, believe in science in, in, in those uh, cases, but unfortunately no. And a couple of months after that post on social media, he died. 
so there were obviously uh, debates among the, the believers whether uh, the communion can, so to say, protect them from uh, the coronavirus and so on. But as I said, the, the church did take a public uh, stance and repeated it on several occasions uh, by the bishops and by the, by the priests who were, uh, who were entitled to go to the media. Uh, to say that the church does not object and does not deny any kind of scientific achievement and that everything that is prescribed by the health authorities should be uh, respected. And even the Bishop Ioannikia that I mentioned earlier, who became the new Metropolitan of Montenegro after the death of Metropolitan Antiochia, uh, he got vaccinated with Pfizer uh, vaccines and he publicized uh, this uh, this event that he got the vaccine in in an attempt to uh, so to say promote uh, vaccination among among people. But obviously, as I said, uh, there are uh, some parts of the uh, Orthodox community which are still doubting the the existence of the coronavirus, and they are still perhaps thinking that faith alone can can save you from this kind of disease, although I must say, and this is very disappointing, and I'm coming to an end because I see that I'm talking too much. Uh, it is very disappointing that in all this, uh, uh, let, let's say, chaos of uh, epidemic elections, uh, political situation, uh, political fight against the church and so on, we did not have uh, any kind of uh, sound uh, scientific debate in, in Montenegro about these things. We never had, for example, a, a talk show uh, that would include a priest and a doctor uh, who could you know, discuss uh, these things, or uh, if we could uh, try in a, in a more, uh, more public way to explain to the people what is going on with the virus. We just had uh, health authorities who were prescribing measures and doctors who were member of members of the, that national coordination body uh, were, of course, in some way explaining uh, the measures, but we did not have any kind of uh, a sound rational debate about uh, these things. So in the very uh, six or seven months uh, uh, from the beginning of the, of, of the epidemic, we mainly had only these kinds of uh, pol political uh, debates and struggles and uh, attempts uh, to uh, show the church as uh, something uh, which is uh, retrograde and something that uh, is, is, is not a positive factor in the, in the society. And that was all uh, in, the, uh, in the service of the upcoming uh, elections. Uh, so though th that would be the, the, the situation that we had uh, in, in 2020, the situation was more or less quite similar uh, last year, but uh, with some measures that were a little bit relaxed. Uh, and we are now uh, coming out of the uh, epidemic, I hope so, and the, the number of uh, infection in, of, of cases is uh, on uh, steady decline in the past uh, couple of months. But in any case, I must say that the uh, political attacks against the church did not stop and they are still coming from the same uh, political forces that lost their elections in, in, in 2020 and they are probably uh, doing it, it because they are unsatisfied of course with the results of those elections. So church has been for the past uh, years and especially in the past three years uh, by some media and uh, some large political forces marked as basically the, the guilty party for all kinds of uh, bad things, including the, the, the pandemic. Uh, 